This is Indianapolis coach, Reggie Wayne, and you listen to the For the Culture podcast. This is the For the Culture podcast. I'm your host, Luke Diamond, with my man, Jason Spears. Happy Halloween to everybody listening on this Halloween evening as the Colts prepare to take on the Pittsburgh Steelers in Week 9 at Heinz Field in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The Colts are coming into this one sitting at 5-2, and two, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Three and four. And again, like the Broncos last week, the Steelers are better than their record shows. Let's start this preview off with the matchup between the Colts defense and the Steeler offense, who comes into this game averaging 21.4 points per game, which is 19th in the NFL, and converting successfully on only 36.7% of third down attempts, which is 22nd in the NFL. Overall, their offense ranks in the bottom third in the league, and their offense is highlighted by quarterback Mason Rudolph, who is the starter now in Pittsburgh. We all know Ben Roethlisberger went down with the elbow injury in the second quarter of Week 2 against the Seattle Seahawks. So Mason Rudolph, nine touchdowns to three picks. He's only been sacked five times. He's only played in five games. He started four. He relieved Ben Roethlisberger with 13 minutes and 23 seconds left in the second quarter, Week 2, against the Seahawks. Pittsburgh was up. 10-7 10-7 when he entered the game. They went on to lose that game. So the Steelers under Mason Rudolph are 2-3 and three overall. They're 2-2 two and two with Rudolph as a starter since taking over for Ben Roethlisberger. He also missed a week with the concussion when he took the hit from Earl Thomas. Their number one wide receiver is Juju Smith-Schuster with 30 receptions, 443 yards, and three touchdowns. He's emerging as a young star now after trading Antonio Brown to Oakland and all that drama there with Antonio Brown. Juju Smith has now emerged as the number one. Their number two is Deontay Johnson with 25 receptions, 296 yards, and three touchdowns. Running back James Conner, who is questionable for this game, Right now, there's a good chance he does not play in this game, which would be big for the Colts. You never root for injuries, but that would be big for the Colts in this game. That would definitely increase the Colts' chances of winning this game because Connor is a huge part of the Pittsburgh Steelers' offense with 97 attempts, 380 yards, averaging 3.9 yards per carry, and four touchdowns. He's done all that on the ground while catching 29 passes for 236 yards and two touchdowns. So very versatile back, very good back. He's done a tremendous job since last year with the holdout for Le'Veon Bell and then Le'Veon Bell leaving in free agency. James Conner's done a tremendous job taking over that number one running back role in Pittsburgh. And that's kind of the theme with this Steeler offense. The last time the Colts played the Steelers, they had Ben Brown and Bell. Now they have Rudolph, Smith-Schuster, and Connor, so they've done a great job with that next man up mentality, kind of like the Colts. You lose Andrew Luck, next man up, Jacoby Brissett, and we just keep moving. So the Steelers sitting at three and four, they've had to replace some big key guys in their organization, especially on the offensive side of the football over the last year and a half as they continue to be a competitive team week in and week out. And another note on their offense, if James Conner doesn't play, Benny Snell also highly unlikely to play in this game, the backup running back. So Pittsburgh doesn't have a lot of injuries. Only three guys have not practiced this week for the Steelers. All three guys coming on the offensive side of the football. So a Pittsburgh Steeler offense that is already towards the bottom in the league coming into this game could be missing a couple of key guys in this Week 9 matchup against the Colts. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of guys on this offense that I like. I like Smith-Schuster. I think he's extremely talented. I think we're going to have a major test trying to cover him. He's a much better version of of Cortland Sutton, so our corners are going to have to come ready to play. Uh, Deontay Johnson's in, like, the T.Y. Hilton, Antonio Brown ilk. He's very fast. He's very quick. If he makes one guy miss, he can take it to the house, obviously. But the bell cow of their offense, though, is James Conner. So if he doesn't play... That is an absolutely enormous loss for Pittsburgh. I mean, he's big in their running game, obviously, big in their passing game. Snell is out, I think. He had arthroscopic surgery today, so I doubt he plays. And then also their uh, right guard, Ramon Foster, is in concussion protocol. So I don't think, you know, we don't know one way or the other, but generally when you get a concussion on a Monday, it's doubtful you're going to pass the protocol and play Sunday. So I would expect him to probably miss the game. Their right, starting right guard, Ramon Foster, but their offense has players, you know, just some other guys on their offense that haven't really played that well this year, but are capable. Obviously, we all know Dante Moncrief. He seems to always show up against us when we play him. 
Uh, and then also James Washington, a wide receiver out of Oklahoma State, who's had some big moments for them. But as a whole, they just haven't put it together. Mason Rudolph's been okay, hasn't been great. Obviously, they miss Ben and the presence that he has in that offense. But they do have some players. I generally don't bring up kickers, but their kicker, Boswell, is 100% from 49 yards and in, and our kicker has been very inconsistent. So that can play a major part in this game because kicking in Pittsburgh is not easy. Boswell's obviously used to it. Benetari's not. So that could be a big factor. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, goes into it to win in a football game. So, you know, it could come down to the kickers. You never know. But as far as just their offense of, uh, as a whole, it's, it's in the, like Luke said, it's in the bottom third. But it's absolutely capable of having a big game. They have big game players. They have players that can make plays. So it's going to be incumbent upon our defense to come out, play well, be technically sound, not get penalties and play within the defense and play within themselves. If they do that, our defense should be fine. Yep, and as far as the for the culture, keys to the Colts' defense, shutting down the Pittsburgh Steelers' offense, number one, limiting penalties. Yeah, and when we played on the road this year, when we've played well like Kansas City, we limited our penalties, didn't have a lot of stupid penalties, played pretty fundamentally sound throughout the game. Penalties can kill you. We saw that last week against Denver. So this week, the key for me is having our defense play error-free football, meaning starting with limiting penalties. Obviously, you're probably going to get a penalty or two, but try to limit them. You know, we can't get five pass interference calls. That's not going to help us, and that's certainly going to put us behind the eight ball on the road. So, yeah, first key, obviously limiting penalties. Number two, limiting big plays. Yeah, and and the Colts have been pretty good about this. They haven't really given up a lot of big plays this year, but Pittsburgh has a couple of big play receivers and and, and Schuster and Johnson. They can both take it to the house. Connor's more of a, a, you know, three and four yards and a cloud of dust type guy, and so – the corners are going to have to play well. It's going to be a test for our corners because, I, you know, we don't know if Desir is going to play. If not, obviously, it's going to be incumbent upon, you know, whoever's out there, whether that be Wilson or, or Rock or, or Kenny Moore or whoever, to really play within themselves, play the techniques correctly, and not be grabby and try to make plays on the ball and not hold the receiver. So no big plays, no big penalties. Those kind of go together. If we can do that or limit those, that's huge for our defense and should make winning the game a lot easier. And number three, get off the field on third downs. Yeah, this is always important in every game, but I think especially in this game, I think this is going to be a close game. I think the more possessions you get, obviously, the better position you're going to put yourself in to win the game. So it's going to be really, really important for us to get off the field on third down and not let you know allow them to continue drives and continue drives and Listen, the, more, the longer they're on the field, the more our defense gets worn out and they can score. And it, Our offense is not a high-scoring offense. So really, you know, the key to this game is going to be you know, how many possessions we can get and, and what we do with those possessions. So getting off the field on third down is obviously it's important in every game. It's going to be really important this one. As far as the Pittsburgh Steelers' defense go, they allow 20.7 points per game, which ranks 13th in the National Football League. They really struggle getting off the field on third down, allowing – teams to convert on 43.7 percent of third downs which is 24th they're 15th against the run overall they're about a top 15 d they rank out about middle of the pack i do believe they are more talented than that i think they're better than their defensive ranking show kind of like how they're better than their record shows they're currently sitting at three and four i think they're better than a sub 500 team their defense is highlighted by inside linebacker devin bush the rookie linebacker out of Michigan with 59 tackles, two interceptions, and a sack. Free safety, Minka Fitzpatrick, who they traded for early in the year when Miami had their fire sale. Personally, I thought that it was a mistake after Ben Roethlisberger went down for the Steelers to give up a first-round pick for a player. I thought it was kind of the Steelers trying to sell their fan base on we're not giving up despite the injury to the quarterback, which I'm all for. I just don't think I would have been for it at that price. I thought a first round pick for Minka was pushing it. Minka, 36 tackles, three interceptions, two forced fumbles. Those are his Miami and Pittsburgh stats combined. Two of those interceptions came this weekend against Miami as Minka Fitzpatrick faced off against his former team. Defensive tackle, Cam Hayward, 34 tackles, 4.5 sacks, one forced fumble. And their two outside linebackers, Bud Dupree, 22 tackles, four sacks, and a forced fumble. And outside linebacker, T.J. Watt, brother of 
Texans, J.J. Watt, who is unfortunately out for the season now for the Texans. T.J. Watt, 14 tackles, 6 sacks, 3 forced fumbles, and an interception. So a balanced Pittsburgh Steeler defense who over the last couple of years, the Steelers have been known for their offense. This year, I believe the defense is finally starting to come along. Statistically, not great, but they have a lot of first-round picks invested on this defense. I think those guys are starting to click, and I think they're only going to get better as the year goes on as they start eight first-round picks on that defense. Yeah, I actually really like their defense. It's not rated super high. It's probably a top 15 overall defense scares me about this game is it's a very similar and you and you said this very similar to Denver three four two really good outside linebackers that can rush the quarterback stout D line this is not a great matchup I don't think for us I think you're going to see Jacoby blitzed a lot and I think you're going to see their coordinator Keith Butler mix it up definitely a lot of a lot of good players on this defense and they get after the quarterback man they they really really get after the quarterback so this is going to be an interesting game uh, I do like this defense. I think it's better than its rating. I like the players they have. I think they match up well against us. I think they're going to pressure Jacoby, so it's going to be incumbent upon him to protect the ball this week and not turn it over because that's what Pittsburgh's defense loves to do. They love to get after the quarterback, force fumbles, you know, force turnovers. That's what they're good at. So, uh, you know, it's going to be a tough game. This is definitely going to be a tough game for the Colts. I hope they can figure out this defense faster. And they figured out the Denver defense. Honestly, I don't think they ever did figure out the Denver defense. So I am definitely concerned. I'm much more concerned with the Pittsburgh defense than I am with their offense. So, you know, this is going to be a really tough game for us. I expect it to be a one-score game. So we're going to have to get those guys blocked one way or the other. Yep, and as far as the keys to the game go, for the Colts offensively, key number one, getting off to a fast start. Yeah, this is not a game where the Colts can come out flat, I don't think. Uh, they don't want to fall behind. One of the stats I know about Frank Reich is he's never lost a game since he's been in Indianapolis when the Colts have led after the first quarter. So they absolutely have to start fast, get some points on the board, and let their defense kind of do their thing. You don't want to fall behind in a place we, we historically don't play well, the defense that forces turnovers and, and really can attack you, especially if you're one dim- in a one-dimensional situation meaning you have to throw the ball. So definitely the number one key for me this week is, is starting fast, getting a lead, and making that team chase us as opposed to us chase them because they have a young quarterback that hasn't been through this, and I think the faster we can put them behind the eight ball, the better our chances are to, to win this game. Key number two for the Colts offense, protect Jacoby Brissett. Yeah, I thought the offensive line struggled last week. I, I don't think it struggled as bad as people made it out that they struggle, but they definitely, it was not one of their better games. They really have to be on their P's and Q's this week. You're going to see a lot of different blitzes. You're going to see a lot of different disguises. And when I say protect Jacoby, I'm not just talking about our, our offensive line. I'm talking about our tight ends, our running backs, and Jacoby himself. Jacoby cannot hold on to the ball this week and, and try to, you know, do the things he did last week, or he's going to turn the ball over. So if it's not there, get rid of the ball, throw it away. It's much better to throw it away and have another, you know, a chance to fight on another down than it is to fumble the ball. So hopefully all those things, all those facets of protection will come into play this week and we'll all, and those guys will do a better job this week. Obviously, you know, the line diagnosing what defense Pittsburgh's in, diagnosing where the pressure is coming from, Jacoby helping him do that, tight ends doing a better job blocking, uh, and the backs doing a better job blocking, and then Jacoby doing a better job taking care of the ball, making better decisions not holding on to it for too long, and getting rid of it when there's nothing there, not trying to force something and end up turning it over. So that's definitely a huge thing, protecting Jacoby, and I think all those things that I've mentioned go into protection, not just the offensive line. And last but not least, key number three, don't turn over the football. Pretty much a key any week to any game. If you want to win, protect the football. We didn't protect the football last week. We lost the turnover battle. One zip. You're not going to win many weeks when that happens. Let's get back on track this week. Protect the football offensively. Don't turn it over. Yeah, the quickest way to get beat in this game is to turn the ball over. So, you know, another huge, huge important game on the road. Big key is not turning the ball over, especially against a defense that feeds off of turnovers, sacks, momentum changes, big momentum plays that can swing the momentum of a game. This is the kind of defense that can do that. The Colts just need to be patient. They need to play their game. 
do exactly what they've been doing and not turn the ball over and really just play their game. If they do that, they'll be in good position to win this game. But if they start turning the ball over, this is a game that could get away from the Colts because Pittsburgh at home is a different team than they are on the road, and it's not an easy place to win. And then you throw in the fact that we're, we're historically bad there. Things tend to snowball on us when we play in Pittsburgh. So definitely not turning the ball over is one of the three keys that will keep us in this game and help us win this game. Yep, and before we give our predictions, just to paint the picture on how bad the Colts have been on the road against Pittsburgh over the last 45 years, since 1974, when we were the Baltimore Colts, the Colts are 1-15 in at Pittsburgh. Since 1984, when the Colts moved from Baltimore to Indianapolis, we are 1-11 and at Pittsburgh, which includes two playoff games. So the Colts have obviously struggled over the years. It doesn't matter who the coach is. It doesn't matter who the quarterbacks are. It doesn't matter who's on defense, who's on offense. It doesn't matter. We have historically struggled against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Kind of like how we've historically struggled against the Chargers. Kind of like how the Titans and Texans have historically struggled against us. Some teams, just for some godforsaken reason, have the other team's number. The Steelers have been that team that have had our number over the years, since the Colts moved to Indianapolis, 2-15 and against the Steelers, 1-11 and at Heinz Field. Don't know why, but for some reason, they have had our number over the years. Hopefully, we can break the curse this weekend. Jason, what is your prediction? Colts at Steelers in week number nine. Yeah, this is definitely out of all the teams in the NFL. This is the this is the team we struggle with the most. I mean, there's no question. It's not even close. Obviously, after last week's prediction of Denver, I uh, me picking the Colts to beat Denver, I said either they either lose or they play really bad, and and obviously that happened. They did not they did not play well last week. So, for a couple of reasons, I am going to pick the Pittsburgh Steelers in this game. First of all, it's in Pittsburgh. We're one and fifteen there, one and eleven there since we moved to Indianapolis. It is not an easy place to play. Very tough to win there, and then obviously. When I pick the Colts to do anything, they always either play bad or lose. And so I don't want to be the reason they lose this week. So I am picking the Steelers. As far as on the field goes, I just think we're going to have a major problem with their defense. Denver doesn't have any – they don't have the players Pittsburgh does on offense. This offense can move the ball. They're going to score more than 13 points. So the Colts are going to have to do something on offense. And I just think it's going to be a struggle with this defense. I mean, Watt is a beast on the outside – Dupree is a beast on the outside. Then you got Hayward on the D line. You got Minka in the secondary, who's a ball hawk and a really, really good player. I think it's going to be a tough game to win. And you throw in the injuries, it doesn't add any, you know, that certainly doesn't help matters. Even if Connor doesn't play, I just think they find a way to win this game. I think it's going to be a seven point game or within seven points because all of our games are. At this point, I assume every game is going to be a touchdown or less, win or lose. So I expect win or lose this game is not going to be any more than a seven point spread. I agree. Up until this point, the Colts have played seven games. Our largest margin of victory, a seven point win against the Texans. Our largest margin of defeat, a seven point loss against the Raiders. So all seven games the Colts have played this season have been within seven points. So I fully expect this game to be a close game. I could see the Colts winning or losing this game by a field goal. History is not on our side. I totally understand where that logic is flawed. I know that a game from 1976 or 1982 or 1999 has zero effect on the 2019 Colts playing the 2019 Steelers. But for some reason, they've had our number over the years, kind of like the Chargers. And now you look at the Chargers. They're not even a good team this season. We thought they would be week one. They were coming off a 12-4 and year from last year. We thought they would be a good team. But they're not a good team. They're most likely going to miss the playoffs, bearing a second-half miraculous comeback from the Chargers. But it doesn't matter what city they play in, whether it's San Diego or Los Angeles. It doesn't matter who the Colts coach is, if it's Dungy, if it's Pagano, if it's Caldwell, if it's Reich. It doesn't matter who the quarterback is. Luck, Manning. Brissett, they always, for some reason, have our number. And they beat us in the weirdest ways with Adam Venetari missing field goals and extra points. They beat us with backup running backs having ridiculous performances like Eckler had this year. Or you think back to Sproles or Turner. For some reason, over the years, the Chargers always have our number. And the Steelers, very similar. Over the last 45 years, 
They've had our number. So I understand where that logic is flawed. I know that that's just superstition and it doesn't really have any effect on this game. But the Colts have been playing with fire. They've been flirting with disaster over the last couple weeks with all these close games. I think it catches up to them this week. And I think they lose a close game on the road. Also would not be surprised if they won this game. And if they get off to a hot start, I fully expect them to hold on and win this game. If they get off to the start Miami got off to and we're up 14 zip, I fully expect to win the game despite what history might tell you. And you know what time it is, Jason. It's time for the For the Culture fan of the show. Today's fan of the show is Justice. Justice has been a Colts fan since 2004. His favorite player on the current team is T.Y. Hillen, a.k.a. Jonathan Joseph's daddy. His two favorite Colts of all time, a tie between Dallas Clark and Bob Sanders. And his two favorite moments of all time, a tie between the Colts' Super Bowl victory in Super Bowl 41 and the 2013 28-point comeback against the Kansas City Chiefs in the wild card round. And give him a follow on Twitter, his Twitter ad handle, at J-M-O-N-E-Y-V-I-C-I-O-U-S-13. Give Justice a follow on Twitter, and we'll be back on Monday with the For the Culture Game Recap Colts Steelers. Can we change the course of history? Enough is enough. I'm sick and tired of losing to the Steelers. Let's go out, play a complete game, and finally beat the Pittsburgh Steelers. We'll be back on Monday with the For the Culture Game Recap right here on the For the Culture Podcast.